and the consequences for the newcomers was devastating. The industrial base of the cities, which up until then had provided stable and cons consistent employment to new migrants, was now evaporating. And because African Americans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and Native Americans began to migrate into the cities in large numbers, as a result of the wartime labor demands of World War II, people of color were disproportionately affected by these new changes, by this crisis of permanent unemployment that began to set in in the post-war period. And of course, that deepens in the 1970s. The situation was such that the Bureau of Labor Statistics began to publish a series of reports in the 1960s on the changes underfoot in the labor force of New York City. These reports articulated a concern over groups of predominantly black and Puerto Rican men in their prime working years who were living in New York's poorest slums. And this is what the report, this, these um, Bureau of Labor Statistics reports say, compared with black and white men, lack of job activity was lowest among Puerto Ricans. In 1966, 47 percent of Puerto Ricans in New York were either unemployed, underemployed, or permanently out of the labor force for lack of success in finding employment. In Chicago, 22 percent of industry left to the suburbs between 1950 and 1977. These conditions were further worsened by the tax base erosion, which further worsened the disrepair of the urban environment after the depression. So there was this tax base erosion in the cities because of suburbanization. These conditions combined with police brutality and northern racism on the one hand, and on the other, the raised expectations about change produced by the Southern, Southern Civil Rights Movement, alongside a very little um, real progress led to the riots. So the riots, to I, that, that was a lot that I put out there. The riots were a consequence of this economic transformation of the city that happened alongside of um, greater segregation in the city because for the first time, people of color who had previously been rural people were becoming urban people. They were coming to the cities at a moment when jobs were evapor evaporating. So those conditions of of unemployment that was permanent and systemic, which had never happened before previously in the history of the city, um, combined with the deterioration of the urban landscape because of the tax base erosion that happened because of white migration out of the city into the suburbs led to an explosive situation. And you add police brutality to that and the crisis in the schools and you have a tinderbox, and that's exactly what happened in the 60s. But the riots also function as a call to action for radical activists. After the riots, radicals understood that militant action alongside a radical analysis of the problems of American society could influence a wide periphery of working class people. The emergence of the Black Panther Party in 1966 was the most dramatic example of this de development. But these post-war changes in the structure of the city also influenced the character of organizations like the Young Lords. It is no surprise that in the context of a post-war urban economy, which was for the first time in modern urban history creating a class of permanently unemployed urban dwellers, that radical organizations like the Young Lords and Black Panthers would launch a critique of this development at the same time that they would decide to organize what they called, quote, the young proletarian, uh, uh, lumpen proletarian cats. Here, they were referring to a term coined by Karl Marx to describe the permanently unemployed and discouraged workers living on the margins of society. So part of what I'm arguing is that it's no surprise that at a moment that the city is creating this class of permanently unemployed people, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords decide that in their analysis, the most revolutionary class is the lumpen proletariat, the, the, the class described by Marx as a marginal, uh, criminally prone, 
permanently displaced class in society. So part of what I argue in my work is that radical grassroots movements cohering in the second half of the decade and into the 70s reflected the distinctive social features of the urban environment in which they emerged. So these young militants were reacting to special conditions at the same time that they were trying to make sense of them. Again, in the cities, the burden of poverty uh, of the kind that was being produced in the post-war period was disproportionately borne by people of color, especially the young men amongst them. Yet in public discourse, urban poverty was increasingly seen as a racial phenomenon rather than as a product of the post-war structural transformation of the cities. And increasingly, racist theories about the dysfunctionality of the black family and the propensity for violence among black and Latino males came to explain the causes of the new urban crisis. Perhaps the most important intervention of the young lords was in the realm of ideas, which they disseminated through their public meetings, their radio program on WBAI, and their newspaper, Palante. This is uh, their newspaper, which is, um, uh, talking about political prisoners, but also encouraging community education. Here we have uh, uh, an analysis of the crisis of urban renewal, which they called SPIC removal. You should know that, in fact, the neighborhood in which we're in right now uh, was a Puerto Rican neighborhood uh, that in which 22,000 Puerto Ricans were displaced to make room for Lincoln Center. And, uh, and the young lords were aware of that and they tried to write about it in their newspaper. Uh, so I think that one of their most important contribution was in terms of the, I, the ideas, uh, the ideas that they were putting forth about uh, the root causes of, of poverty uh, and crime and um, and despair in, in uh, poor, predominantly African-American and Latino communities. At a moment when culture of poverty arguments were dominant, right, that the problem in the cities was the, actually the culture of uh, the people who lived in them, predominantly African-Americans and Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans, the young lords argued vehemently that the problems afflicting Puerto Ricans and African Americans were not cultural, but structural and beyond the control of these two groups. They pointed to the ways in which sectors of the African American and Puerto Rican communities were becoming redundant and therefore dispensable as a result of automation, and argued that capitalism was to blame for the problems confronting both communities. In fact, Contrary to the static narrative of the post-war urban crisis as a force that prostrated communities of color, the local histories of the Young Lords and Black Panthers suggest that they were among the first to identify the causes of and launch a fight back against what we know today and what the Academy identified in the 70s and 80s as the urban crisis. At the same time, the increased racism in mainstream political debates about the root causes of the urban crisis, coupled with the increased racial segregation in the cities, that people of color were moving in and white people were moving out, made an interracial struggle with white Americans very difficult to imagine. Now, I want you to pay a little attention to this. So because of white flight during this period, the material basis for black and white solidarity, which was the usual call of the left, was evaporating. What we see happening is that the era's nationalist orientation was shaped by the demographic changes taking place in the cities. This situation, in part, determined the strong nationalism of urban radical politics in the 1960s as practiced by people of color. Theoretically and politically, the young lords coalesced on the basis of race and ethnicity, reflecting the residual racial ideology of old racial structures in America. However, on the ground, the young lords were a harbinger of things to come, 
The group reflected the diverse racial and ethnic makeup of the postmodern city, of which Los Angeles is the best, best example. So I'm going back to the ethnic diversity of the organization. Despite its largely Puerto Rican membership and professed Puerto Rican nationalism, the Young Lords attracted Chicanos, African Americans, and other Latinos. According to Iris Morales, former member of the Young Lords and producer of the documentary film on the Young Lords, Palante Siempre Palante, quote, activists who had participated in the civil rights, black liberation, and cultural nationalist movements joined. Puerto Ricans were a majority of the members, but African Americans made up about 25% of the membership. Other Latinos, Cubans, Dominicans, Mexicans, Panamanians, and Colombians also joined. One member was Japanese Hawaiian, unquote. Most importantly, Non-Puerto Rican members were not merely passive participants in the organization, but were integral to its lifeblood. Denise Oliver, an African American, was the first woman elected to the Young Lords Central Committee. This is their paper, more on the Young Lords. Uh, this is one of their uh, uh, marches to the UN. Uh, here you see, this is David Perez in the breakfast program. I want to get us to, um, these are all women of the Young Lords. That's Denise Oliver. She's an African-American woman who was a member of the Young Lords from the inception of the organization here in New York, and she was the first woman elected to the leadership body, the Central Committee. Then there's Omar Lopez, the major strategist of the Chicago Young Lords, who was, who was Mexican-American. The attraction of the Young Lords to African-Americans in New York was certainly influenced by the fact that its leadership body was composed in part of two black Puerto Ricans, Felipe Luciano and Juan Fi Ortiz, and an Afro-Cuban, Pablo Guzman. So these, this is the leadership the initial leadership of the Young Lords uh, in, in New York. Uh, the middle guy is Juan Gonzalez. This is uh, uh, Pablo Yoruba Guzman. This is Felipe Luciano. And that's over there Juan Fi Ortiz. So part of what we see is that the leadership body of the Young Lords is composed of black Puerto Ricans. And because of that, that essentially uh, sends a message to the African-American community in, in East Harlem, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, where they were organizing that black people and African-Americans in particular are welcome. And this is hugely advanced for this period. The Young Lords were in fact among the first Latinos to begin to theorize the ways in which racism uh, is constructed um, and the ways in which uh, racism functions not in North America, in the U.S., but in Latin, but in Latin America. The Young Lords exposed the different forms of racism within the Puerto Rican community and challenged its internalized forms. They explained racism within Puerto Rican society as the byproduct of Spanish conquest, Native American genocide, African slavery, and American imperialism. And here, uh, this is a story, uh, uh, an article in their paper about Puerto Rican uh, racism. They denounced the use of common sense ideas and language that designated woolly hair as pelo malo, bad hair, and fine hair as pelo bueno, good hair. Uh, the, the, essentially, the good hair, bad hair dichotomy within um, within Latino culture. As such, the Young Lords were among a generation of Puerto Ricans who began the job of theorizing race in Latin American history, language, and society, a subject that is increasingly popular today in the field of Latino and Latin American studies. This kind of working relationship between African Americans and Puerto Ricans within the Young Lords was incubated in the shared experiences of both groups in the decades following World War II. The hybridity of experience between blacks and Puerto Ricans was anchored materially in the shared condition of social and economic disadvantage that these groups endured together at precisely the same time. 
Both groups shared a similar condition before the dominant society as racialized and colonized subjects. But what more accounts for the young Lord's deep sense of unity and solidarity with African Americans? As mentioned earlier, the timing of Puerto Rican migration and the fact that it coincided with the rise of the civil rights movement would have an enormous impact on the consciousness of a new generation of Puerto Ricans. But before finding widespread political expression in the 1960s and 70s, the common currents between African Americans and Puerto Ricans were expressed in music as they for decades worked, studied, and created alongside each other despite their differences. As noted by sociologist and cultural theorist Juan Flores, quote, African Americans and Puerto Ricans in New York had been partying together for many years. Since the musical revolutions of the late 1940s, when musical giants like Mario Bauza, Machito, and Dizzy Gillespie joined forces in the creation of Cubop and Latin jazz. It was on the dance floor that the experiences of a generation of blacks and Puerto Ricans rear in a moment of racial struggle and solidarity gave shape to the boogaloo, which combined R&B and soul traditions with Afro-Cuban musical idioms. The boogaloo became hugely popular among both groups with Joe Cuba's Bang Bang and Pete Rodriguez's I Like It Like That. Speaking of the cultural hybridity of that period, Felipe Luciano observed, quote, the relationships that Puerto Ricans developed with black people were so deep and so loving and so contradictory and so enmeshed that it developed a new culture and you could hear it in the music. Blacks and Puerto Ricans in New York, when you say the word, it already connotes a whole experience. The Young Lord's close affiliation with the Black Panther Party, the most persecuted black revolutionary organization of the 1960s, is testament to the radicalization of the period and the kind of cross-ethnic and cross-racial solidarity of the 19, that the 1960s produced. The Black Panther Party platform and activities uh, which were central to the process of radicalization of this period, the, their platform really expresses how this radicalization took place and its depth. And I wanna read from the, um, from that platform, quote, we want the power to determine the destiny of our black community, full employment for our people, and end to the robbery by the white man of our black community, decent housing, fit for shelter of human beings, education, an immediate end to police brutality, clothing, justice, and peace. And the Black Panther Party's survival programs and their dramatic civilian patrol unit of the police was a brilliant application of their politics because they addressed the causes of the riots in both economic and political terms. So part of what we see is that the Black Panther Party is really capturing the imagination of a generation. They're identifying the issues in their totality that um, people in urban centers are, uh, are uh, concerned about and they're putting forth a project in the streets to address these issues like a breakfast program. And police brutality, of course, was this huge problem. And they decided that they were going to create a, 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 a police patrol unit made up of members of the community that was gonna go around and police the police, not unlike what people are doing today with um, the crisis of stop and frisk. Um, so I'm being asked to wrap up. Uh, so part of what we see happening um, in this period uh, are a few things. The organizations that emerge in, um, in the late 60s and 70s reflect the complex demographic changes of urban cities. So the urban city the urban, uh, uh, urban centers. Uh, urban centers are now a lot more multiracial than they've ever been before because people from all over the world are migrating to cities, but not, uh, not from Europe, but from the third world, from Latin America, from Asia, from Africa, especially 
uh, in the aftermath of the um, 1965 Civil Rights Bill, which in fact has a huge impact on immigration policy that makes it illegal to discriminate against people coming from Africa and Asia. So that opens up the city uh, to a completely different population that didn't have access to it previously. And so the diversity of the young lords is a reflection of that. Its politics is also being informed by the creation of permanent unemployment uh, and deindustrialization. Uh, and its nationalist politics is being influenced also by white flight out of the city. The fact that um, there are, the, the, the cities are becoming more segregated by race. Uh, whites are no longer around, so the, the, the previous call for blacks and whites to unite and fight doesn't really make sense in a city that is, um, that is producing unemployment on a massive scale and where white people are nowhere to be found. Uh, so to conclude, there's a lot that can be concluded about this age of great dreams during which ordinary people took the reins of history in their own hands. One of the most important contributions of radicals was that they helped alter the terms of the political debate in America. In the 1960s, however, radicals like the Young Lords challenged um, this idea of the culture of poverty, which has been so important in passing regressive social policy in the last 30 or 40 years. They argued that poverty was brought about by circumstances beyond the control of the poor, and that these circumstances had long historical roots and that they were tied to the organization of society. They won the argument that racial oppression was a natural outgrowth of a society divided by class that urban renewal in the form of gentrification and business-sponsored development would not solve the profound problems of urban deindustrialization and disrepair. And finally, among other things, they argued that imperialist war was not acceptable in a democratic society. These are all arguments that merit consideration and urgent proliferation in American society today. Thank you. The fact that they were citizens of the United States, well, it certainly afforded them a level of uh, security, perhaps, that, that other migrants might not have enjoyed. Uh, although, you, we could say that um, even though they were citizens, they were persecuted by the police and surveilled by COINTELPRO. So their citizenship status didn't necessarily protect them um, from government persecution. Uh, but I, I, think, I think more than their citizenship status, uh, because Panamanians joined, Colombians joined, um, I think it was really the fact that they migrated to New York and to other cities precisely at the moment when these huge social movements were emerging. And, and the young amongst them were, were profoundly influenced politically. So this is important because a lot of people you know, that I talk to young people, they say, well, why are young people today so apathetic? And why can't, um, why can't we get it together, like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords? Well, these groups emerged out of a particular historical moment that was leading in the direction of struggle. And it wasn't a domestic Phenomenon. This was an international movement, really, uh, and the international context of revolution in previously colonized uh, societies had a huge impact on the sense of possibility that uh, is needed in order to fight. Because 
in order to fight, you have to have a sense of confidence that maybe you're going to win. Where demoralized people don't fight, and there were there were victories, you know, India, Vietnam, Algeria. Uh, the map of Africa was transformed in the post World War II period. Uh, so and and European colonization was uh, uh, was overthrown. So uh, especially for Puerto Ricans who who uh, are you know, a colony of the United States, who, that, that Puerto Rican, who are, who see themselves, or some of them see themselves as colonial subjects, this was an opportunity to raise the issue of Puerto Rican independence. Um, so, so I, I don't know that it's, it's citizenship, because in fact, many of, they were citizens, but most people didn't know that they were citizens, and they felt like outsiders. They, they really, and maybe it's that sense of outs, being an outsider, even though you are a citizen, that led their, that led to their rebellion. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Sally. Sally. Sorry, I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, uh, Barbara Young Career Center, I, I just wanted to add to what you said. I don't think most people know that Puerto Ricans are citizens. They have no idea why. It's not taught in the schools. Did anyone in here study Puerto Rican history in school? You know, I didn't know when I came to New York that Puerto Ricans uh, were citizens, you know. And the fact that they speak another language. You see, when, when people say American, they think, oh, then all Americans speak English, you know. And uh, so I, I think that most people should not know. Because mm -hmm. they were not educated to know that they're mm -hmm. U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, well, um, I was really enlightened by your lecture, especially since I didn't know much about the Young Lords, and um, I think I learned a lot more about the Black Panthers than I did with the Young Lords, so my question is in reference to maybe um, a lot of the themes that we've been studying in the course, um, and a lot of documentary, um, films that we've been watching have highlighted the idea of divide and conquer, and how you know we can get the black man to go against the white poor man who um, can go against the, you know, the, the Puerto Rican poor man, and I'm wondering whether or not why you think or um, don't think that, um, why didn't the Black Panthers and the Young Lords merge together and organize together if they did, or why they didn't? Well, they did work together. Um, and in fact, uh, in Chicago, Fred Hampton, who was the leader of the Black Panther Party, alongside of Chacha Jimenez, uh, launched a coalition called the Rainbow Coalition. Uh, I don't know if you, remember Jesse Jackson's campaign uh, for presidency. For the, uh, well, he took that title from the black, this coalition that was forged by the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, but also by poor whites from Appalachia in a group called the, the, young, young, the young Patriots the Young Patriots. So there was an attempt on the part of, the, of these organizations to come together on the basis of class interests across racial lines. And Fred Hampton paid a pretty price, I mean a high price, for, for that leadership. He was assassinated um, by COINTELPRO agents uh, in 1968. So, I mean, in one of the most violent government-led uh, attacks on the, black, uh, on the Black Panthers of that period. Um, and I, it, it's such a fascinating and tragic history of uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal, who was a Philadelphia Panther, went to cover the assassination of Fred Hampton to Chicago. When he came back from Chicago, April 24th, this Wednesday, because it's his birthday, and we're protesting in Chicago against his incarceration. Well, at the Church of the Advocate, in speaking about 
what the government had done to the Black Panther Party and to Fred Hampton. He said that power comes out of the barrel of a gun, quoting Chairman Mao, about what the state had done to Fred Hampton. That line was quoted at his trial to argue that Black Panthers were obsessed with killing cops. And on that basis, he got the death penalty. So, uh, just a side note. But yes, I mean, the Young Lords and the Black Panthers were working together. In fact, part of what has not been studied is the ways in which these organizations, and then there's the Brown Berets and their membership, people switched over from one organization to, to the other. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, the rhetoric and use the, the action. Use the mic, please. The rhetoric and the action are police. Excuse me. Put, put, uh, your, put the mic on. Because <laughs> we're recording, sir. Oh, okay. Yeah. The rhetoric and the action are two different things. Uh, I don't believe that these people were revolutionaries. Uh, that's too strong a word. They were radicals. Uh, they were radicals for the poor. Uh, they did not, in general, commit any illegal acts. In fact, her uncle, Gerardo Rivera from Fox News, was a member of this group. And Gerardo Rivera at the time was a lawyer. And Gerardo Rivera used to uh, give them advice uh, uh, on, on legal actions that they would take. Uh, at the time, in New York, you could walk around with a weapon. And in fact, Felipe Luciano and someone else, I don't remember his name, were in front of the church with a rifle. And that was legal in New York at the time. Uh, again, I, I just want to emphasize that these people did not engage, in general, in illegal actions. And uh, I, I happened to uh, know some of them, and I used to witness uh, these people's uh, protests. One of the, the individuals that you showed, the, uh, 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 Carlos Aponte, used to visit me in my home in Brooklyn. So I just want to clarify that. Thanks. Well, um, what defines revolutionary politics and activity? Uh, they believed in the overthrow of American capitalism and American empire, and they believed in uh, the independence of Puerto Rico. Uh, and the fact is that, do you think that members of the Communist Party were revolutionary? I mean, at some moments they were, uh, but revolutionary organizations uh, engage in different levels of activity at different moments in history according to the political context within which they're operating. Now, what is argued, what I argue in one of my articles that you probably read is that they were some, that I call it between social service reform and revolutionary politics. So, in many ways, the radicals of the, of the 1960s were engaged in feeding the community and in actions that we associate with social workers. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would argue that they're, that's a tactical decision to essentially uh, recruit members of the community and relate to a community that uh, is experiencing great need. You also have a situation in which um, the Red Scare of the 1950s has debilitated the labor movement. And because the left has been the labor left, right? And the people who argued that the working class were the major force that can produce change in society because those people have been devastated by the Red Scare, 
And because those amongst them who were left were not able to relate to this emerging youth movement, the politics that emerge of the left and of revolutionaries is what it is, right? We, it's the, it speaks to the poverty of the left in American history, not necessarily to the revolutionary proclivities of the people who call themselves revolutionary. One more question, Ms. King. Yeah, my name is Erlene King, and I am an ISD student. I read some of your work, and I knew about the um, let, let, um, paint removal and things like that, but I did not even know that it was the, um, the young lords who initiated that because no credit was given to them. You know, I know the government was taking care of things, and you know, we were happy to the community, but the praise and the credit did not go to the people who really fought for this effort. And that's, you know, like the usual thing. Because right. all the work they did, they got no credit for it. Because today, my kids doesn't know anything about them doing anything about you know, like that poisoning. And that's very sad. Well, I think that part of what we learn from the history of this period is that, and from social movements generally, is that at every turn, the definition of American democracy has been determined and stretched by people at the bottom of society. It hasn't been handed down by the government. And uh, in this instance, I think it's important to note that a lot of different people, mothers, groups, were fighting around the crisis of lead poisoning amongst children because, as you know, children die and become brain dead from, uh, or mentally challenged as a result of eating the chips of paint. But no one took it to the streets the way the young lords did. The young lords decided that they were gonna have press conferences and that they were gonna sit in at, you know, uh, the offices of the people who were in charge of this crisis, supposedly, and they made um, a media issue out of this. And the Village Voice covered a series of articles on the activities of the young lords, and one of them was titled, The Young Lords Do the City's Work. Uh, so it was a combination of muckraking and social service work uh, and activism in the streets in the form of sit-ins that really, at this critical juncture, made this a huge issue that the government then had to respond to with the passage of the Bureau of Lead Poisoning in 1970. I think it was in 1970 or 71. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's important for young people to know that those who influenced the city of the city, the, the history of the city, were the young lords were, they were 16, 17, and 18. There were a number of them who were in their 20s, but these were very, very young people with, with a purpose, commitment, and passion. Because today young people don't do things like that, they're not being covered. Yeah, I mean, we need this, history is important for that reason. That's a great way to end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.